recorded now. Uh, I'll try to watch my language too. Good morning, everybody. Uh, yesterday's video is still uploading, and I can't make excuses for that. I, I think it's just a consequence of the entire planet using the internet, and the internet service providers chose not to upgrade their systems. And so they're having to throttle everybody to keep it working. And although I'm angry about it, I can't do anything about it, and there's no evil involved. It's just stuff that used to take an hour is taking pretty much half a day, and that's life. Um, tomorrow, the exercise set one uh, is programmed to be due. And before the end of this meeting, I'd like you all to uh, comment on... Um, on where you think you are on that. Uh, and it, sh it shows one day in 14 hours, but I don't actually know the current time the computer thinks it's on. So worst case, I mean, it's one day. Well, one day in seven hours, because it's it might be on EU time. Um, if, if you're making progress, that's fine, and don't worry about it. Upload it tomorrow morning, whenever. Uh, if you're not making progress, bring it up uh, before I'm done today. See, any other administrative stuff to comment? Um, I don't think so. So today's topic is on, is on uh, evapotranspiration, and I'm going to go to it via through the Moodle site, and I want to get to the first page because what I'm doing right now is checking that the link works, and that's a win, and um, let's navigate this a little bit, except you can't see my screen. Are y'all seeing my screen? I don't think I'm sharing it yet. That was stupid. There we go, and now it's being recorded properly. Okay, so let me um, go back and do what I was doing. I was here, and I clicked on this deal, and it took me there. Okay, big whoop. The internet still works. Um, this is a, a brief introduction to evaporation and transpiration uh, processes, and actually pretty brief. I had intended there to be a lot more detail, and it took me a lot of time to figure out some pieces of it in a way to uh, simplify it enough for my own thinking as well as to share with other people. I didn't get as far as I would like to. However, it's not empty. So there are PowerPoint files, which I'll go through shortly. There's a couple of data files, which I'll um, uh, explain those when we get to that point in the lesson and a couple of spreadsheets that I have uh, laying around that might be useful in your future. Uh, the video materials, I'm pretty sure that's, yeah, that's still a placeholder. That link will come live when I finally get it uploaded, actually when we get it uh, recorded. And there's some readings, and we'll actually visit a few of these during the lesson today. So let me get... 18 megabyte download. I will gamble that it will happen in our lifetime. Oh, good. That's faster than I'm used to in the last week. And in a way, that was stupid since I already have a local copy. I don't have to remember to delete this. To run out of disk space. Okay, that actually worked. All right, so um, the topic is evapotranspiration, and later on in the class, when we're using uh, a couple of the professional software programs, um, there's opportunity in those to incorporate some aspects of evapotranspiration. Hence, the point of this is to build ourselves enough background to be able to interpret what those tools are asking for. So the photograph is a mountain lake 
uh, somewhere in Central Europe, I, th I think is what the uh, credit said. And we see um, what looks to be steam or water vapor rising up above the lake. That's probably not unusual for any of us. We've all witnessed that at some point. What is unusual about this particular photograph is the time of day that's occurring. Because uh, as you look at the shadows, um, they're not terribly long. So this is pretty close to midday. I don't know if it's prior to noon, local noon, or just after local noon. But to see visible water vapor midday on a lake anywhere, I would imagine is pretty unusual. Um, so that's to get us started. There's evaporation. We can see it. Uh, it's a part of our friend the water cycle, and there's our friend the water cycle here. Uh, there's a precipitation that uh, drives everything. There's the sun that provides the energy for the evapotranspiration and, and open water evaporation. Oh, and evaporation over here. So it's these wiggly red lines headed to the uh, sky. And um, you can laugh at or, or not my... Uh, my drawing scheme, uh, it gives us a discussion point. So we're going to look at these uh, green circles here. And generally in, in the computational tools, evapotranspiration is treated as a loss in the context that it's a loss from the rainfall signal or a loss from the surface, if you will, back to the atmosphere. And by all rights, there should be green circles out here over the ocean, but my conjecture is uh, we probably don't care much about ocean evaporation from an engineering, hydrology, or even a hydrologic science um, perspective, because we know it happens, and there's not much we can do about it or gain from it. I guess if they all dry up, we got bigger issues than whether there's a circle on it or not. <coughs> Oh, my throat's been dry. You know, one of the nice benefits of this uh, work from home is that you can at least have drinks and you don't have to worry about <coughs> spilling them on uh, state-owned equipment. You still have to worry about spilling if you're clumsy like me. Um, next slide. So, um, let's look at some of the processes involved. So these photographs um, and the um, statement beneath them uh, are worth considering. This is, an, again, an attempt to visualize a couple of aspects of the evaporation process as we implement it in our hydrology uh, story. So I'm just going to read the uh, statement. The two main factors influencing evaporation from an open water surface are the supply of energy to provide latent heat of vaporization and the ability to transport that vapor away from the evaporative surface. Solar radiation is the main source of heat energy, although the picture on the right is a, a complete contradiction to that, but generally solar radiation is what we consider the main source of heat energy and the ability to transport vapor away from the evaporative surface is influenced by the wind velocity of the surface and the specific humidity gradient in the air above it. We'll examine each of those uh, shortly. So the coffee cup here on the left, uh, we can see the water vapor, mostly water, coffee vapor. Um, it's got just enough uh, flavor in it to uh, well, actually, it's not coffee. That's a cup of tea because I can see the uh, string. Anyway, there's this gentle airflow, and so the moisture-rich air right here is being advected, in this case, from right to left. And what's coming in is, is drier air. And the importance of that over the evaporative surface is even if there's energy to drive the water molecules into the vapor phase, if the air immediately above the surface is already saturated with water vapor, 
no net um, mass transfer can occur. But with this airflow blowing the moisture, the moisture rich air away from the surface and bringing in drier air, uh, that allows um, continued evaporative uh, transport. And that's what's meant by this last part of the statement, the specific humidity gradient in the air above it. This middle picture is showing another bucket with um, uh, a vapor arising from it. It looks like the lid was just lifted off. Um, and the source of energy in this case is a small camping stove. So that's putting energy into the vessel, which raises the temperature of the liquid inside it. Uh, to the point that the liquid has uh, enough energy that it can overcome the um, heat uh, the uh, heat required to change state from liquid to gas. That's called a latent heat of vaporization. And I, I there's getting deep thermodynamics at constant pressure, constant volume. But uh, for example, for water, it's around. 9,800 BTUs of energy per pound of water to uh, change it from liquid to gas phase. And it takes a lot less energy with respect to water to get it up to the 100 degrees Celsius. Um, I think it's only a, a, a couple of BTUs per pound to cause a uh, one degree temperature change, a one degree Celsius temperature change. I have to go look that up. And I admit BTUs is probably an unusual energy unit, but it's one I'm uh, familiar with. So, and well, there's our source of energy. And in open water like lakes and streams and puddles and even flooded fields, the source of energy, hopefully it's not a camp stove, um, would be the uh, uh, solar energy. Um, shining on the uh, water. And then there's a, a good, um, an unresolved issue, at least in my mind, on, on whether if that's shaded so that the solar energy is still there but it can't directly hit the water surface, does that reduce its ability to, um, to knock water molecules into the vapor phase? And the picture here on the right is a geothermal area, so we still have the uh, water um, evaporating, but actually in this picture on the right, the source of energy is the heat of the earth, so it's actually a pretty good analog to this camp stove. The camp stove at the center of the earth is called the, I watched some bad science fiction, I should remember that. It's what Dr. Evil was trying to get um, to blow up and let all the volcanoes off. So you get them in a million, gazillion, pavilion dollars from the World Organization League. If you don't watch bad Mike Myers movies, don't start. They'll ruin your brain. So those pictures we've just shown, we can replace them with this conceptual model here. So here's our coffee cup or lake, if you will. In this case, the lake is actually, think of it as dug into the ground. So we have this cylindrical representation of a water body somewhere and it has water in it to a certain depth in this case uh, H and that water has some temperature associated with it okay so that represents its uh, its its energy at the moment and if we have constant um, temperature water then the energy uh, change in the water would be the actual uh, volume change in it. That would be called the uh, advected energy flux. And uh, we'll see that those words again in a minute. But a fraction of that heat uh, leaks out into the ground. And so there is a meaningful heat loss. We have solar radiation coming in to the uh, control volume uh, that adds energy back to it and counteracts that heat conduction to the ground. And in some context, uh, if it's bigger than the heat loss, it should raise the average temperature of the uh, uh, water. Uh, there's heat loss from the water to the air, and this is called sensible heat to the air. And then as this water um, 
vaporizes, it forms a moisture rich layer, if you will, right at the surface of air that can be advected away, and that's the vapor flow rate. And so those are the thermodynamic concepts of evaporation. In Chow Maidment and Mays, pages 80 to those 11 pages, 80 to 91, have a fairly um, elaborate description of the process that's depicted by this picture. In fact, this picture is taken directly from that book. And I will leave that to you to read on your own. Um, to, uh, I can't do justice to it by grabbing bits and pieces and explaining it. It's better off if you just read it. There are two um, major, uh, I'm calling them models here, ways of thinking about the evaporation process. And even though they're being presented independently, they're intended to be thought of together. Uh, the first is something called a mass transfer or the atmospheric model. And what that model says is that the evaporation uh, rate is equal to a mass transfer coefficient and the linear driving force model, which is based on wind speed and the difference in vapor pressures um, at the water surface and in the... Uh, in the surrounding air. And in this particular uh, equation is written here, it's implicitly assumed that the saturation vapor pressure at the water surface is greater than or equal to the sap saturation vapor pressure of water in the air. And that kind of makes sense. It seems odd that it could be the other way around, so it probably isn't. Um, I'm taking this from uh, the references shown at the bottom of the screen. Now, surely there's been work since 1962, but this was a pretty simple representation of the uh, mass transfer model. It's probably used today, um, even stuff from the 90s and the 2000s. I bet if, you, if we dug deep into it, it would be as simplistic as represented here. Now, this mass transfer coefficient ultimately is going to be the... Um, difficult to resolve component of that expression because you would have to make measurements to determine the mass transfer coefficient. So the uh, various vapor pressures um, can be done by table lookup on properties of water. And just as an aside, you note that everything's a non-homogeneous unit. So this is a horrible equation from um, freshman engineering perspective, but it, it captures the uh, pieces. The driving force is the difference in um, humidity, if you will, or how dry the air is above the uh, evaporative surface. And the wind speed is how fast the air is being driven away. And N is just a constant of proportionality that relates those two factors to the evaporation rate. So how we can find those different uh, values. Um, the uh, saturation vapor pressure uh, can be determined from the air temperature and the dew point temperature. If we know those two values, uh, we can calculate saturation vapor pressure using the formula on the screen. And I used to know the name of this formula. It's, it's a funny hyphenated name. It's like Gibblingangang um, And if if you search the uh, literature in, in this context of evaporation, the name of the formula will come up. So this constant 6.11 is um, was obtained from um, many years of observations. And in, in the exponent in the power 10, um, the denominator is clearly converting temperatures in Celsius into uh, degrees Kelvin, and then the uh, upper part is undoubtedly a log-log fit to observe data. Okay, that aside, the uh, saturated vapor pressure is uh, the formula when we apply air temperature, and the, um, in the Air saturation uh, pressure is the formula when we apply the dew point temperature. 
And in these uh, expressions right here, these are uh, producing pressure in millibars. As a bonus, if we just take the ratio of those two, we get the relative humidity. So now oftentimes in meteorological data that we have access to, either air temperature and dew point are reported or air temperature and relative humidity are reported. So if you have either of those two, you have the necessary information to estimate evaporation mass transfer. Um, if we want to find the uh, saturation, we just use the water temperature. And, or we could look up in a table of liquid properties. And, or the odds of that actually working. I'll be darned. So if we went to it, let's go to a very warm summer day, 40 degrees Celsius. And it breaks. Oh, it's no big deal. Anyway, it produces the same results as that equation does. Where was I? Was I here? No, I was in a PowerPoint. That's what I get when I try to get fancy. Okay, we'll move on. Um, so that table of liquid properties was, when it works, it's taken directly from a fluid mechanics textbook. Uh, the next part of the uh, question is, how do we find that mass transfer coefficient? Um, we should make field observations over several episodes, perhaps a couple weeks in the winter, then a couple weeks in the spring, a couple weeks in the summer, a couple weeks in the fall. We'll probably do that for a few years. Use the observations, fit the model, and recover the value of n that best explains the um, behavior. Of course, that... In terms of observations, that means we have to have some way of, actual, of measuring the actual evaporation. And that in itself might be a challenge, although there are tools to do that now. The um, second approach to N is there are empirical relationships in the literature. There's dozens of them. I didn't put any here. I didn't come across any that I thought were simple enough. Um, this particular model is attractive for simulation use because it uses inputs that are readily available and or easy to measure. Temperature, relative humidity, and wind speed are all available in many locations, and they're certainly easy to measure. And by easy to measure, we can buy turnkey instruments that you can put out on a lake or in a field somewhere that can, we can measure the the uh, temperature and the wet bulb temperature, from that you can calculate dew point, from that you can calculate relative humidity, and it can measure wind speed. So all the pieces are available if we have the mass transfer coefficient. Um, clearly calibrating it is vital, and over time you would start to suspect your estimates if the climatic conditions depart greatly from the conditions that were used to determine the mass transfer coefficient. The second approach is uh, an energy budget approach. And it's got a lot of letters of the alphabet in it, but it's not a terribly complicated um, equation. I mean, it's, it's really the, um, the numerator is a, a net um, energy input, and the denominator is uh, <clears throat> the energy in, it's the um, net energy required to vaporize a quantity of water. Um, so if we look at the uh, various heat flows, we have incoming solar radiation, uh, reflected solar radiation, incoming long wave, reflected long wave, long wave from the water, energy invected into the lake, um, change in storage en energy. So net energy invected into the lake is normally done as a product of temperature and flow rate. And then the stored energy is the temperature of the lake uh, multiplied by the water level in the lake, multiplied by some area that represents the total volume of the lake. So that you have, you have depth times area times temperature gives you an approximation of the net energy in the lake. 
latent heat of vaporization is, is uh, looked up in a set of thermodynamics tables. In this particular representation, it's in goofy units, calories per gram. Um, R is a Bowen ratio. We'll see how that's computed shortly. And T naught is the water surface temperature. And so this could be converted to um, meaningful units as needed. To determine the Bowen ratio for the latent heat calculation, uh, this uh, relationship is used here, which is the temperature difference between um, water temperature and air temperature, and then the um, difference in the uh, saturation vapor pressures multiplied by the observed atmospheric pressure multiplied by a scale factor of 0.61 produces a quantity known as the uh, uh, Bowen ratio. And some of the other terms, um, the incoming radiation, uh, various components of it can be measured using a thing called a radiometer. Um, the other radiation terms are generally estimated from methods um, discussed in Anderson or Koberg or something more recent. And stored and invective energy is temperature based. So the energy is a temperature times volume relationship. So all those pieces are put together for an energy budget um, model. And if you have the if you have all those measurements, you can estimate evaporation, actually um, yeah, calculate evaporation. This model is also attractive for simulation because most of those inputs are generally available. Temperature, relative humidity. I stipulate that's already relatively available. Incoming radiation requires the right instrument. Um, these are pretty, um, they're pretty fragile, precise instruments, but they exist. Uh, the advective fluxes um, can be accurately estimated by making temperature measurements and flow measurements. Um, there's adaptations required to adapt it to a non-open water setting. Um, but those are reasonably well documented. And when you blend the two approaches, the uh, mass transfer or the atmospheric and the energy budget, um, you have the basis of the models that are described in Chow, Maven, and Mays and most other references. So most practical application of either direct evaporation or even evapotranspiration is some variant of the combination of the energy budget, and that's to get water vapor into the air, and then the um, mass transfer budget to move the water vapor away from the evaporating area and bring in more dry air. So how do we make measurements? Um, there's a, a couple of instruments that are pictured here. I probably should have a picture down in this lower right corner of a, of a lysimeter, but all that would look like is a field with wires coming out of the ground. They're not very exciting looking. Um, one technique that's, that's old is an evaporation pan, and a more modern one is an eddy covariance instrument. So an evaporation pan, so here's a nice picture of one. It looks very elaborate. you got this pan and this pallet, and there's some sort of container here. That's a rain gauge. It's got a little spinny thing here to figure out what the wind speed is. And it's got some sort of floaty dealy here, I think, to add makeup water. And you know, that pan looks like it's uh, some kind of um, bronze-coated uh, stainless steel. Okay, so and this, this, this picture probably cost a couple thousand dollars uh, delivered to your site. Um, that's overkill. I mean, a, uh, an evaporation station is literally a stock tank, not too tall, um, some way to measure local meteorological conditions, in particular wind speed, rainfall, and some way to keep track of how much water you have to add to the pan or remove from the pan to keep the water level at a predetermined elevation. So in the bulk, these are really simple instruments. They've been used for at least a couple hundred years, uh, so you could argue they're pretty reliable. They're certainly not going to be 
They, they don't have any ability to actually uh, measure what's actually evaporating. It's, it's all done by a different uh, formulation. Whereas the eddy covariance instruments actually measure the speed of water vapor laden air moving past these ET fingers. And then the gas analyzer um, from uh, infrared returns into this region here determines what gases are in that air. Um, so carbon dioxide sends a pretty strong signal and water vapor sends a strong signal. Those can be um, readily uh, determined with the infrared gas analyzer. Obviously, well maybe not obviously, it should be somewhat apparent because of the fact it has wires and little widgety things here and fancy words, but this one on the left cost a lot more. Um, last time I looked at these instruments for uh, purchase, they were in the $150,000 to $200,000 range just for the instrument, and they burned through about $7,000 a year of um, um, calibration gases. So this this instrument has a lot of consumables involved. This instrument here, the only consumable is uh, time. Uh, even with well, the way this thing is uh, configured, someone has to go visit it once a day, probably spend half an hour making measurements and getting rid of the rats' nests and taking the armadillos out of the tank. Um, but the instrument itself is cheap and has no consumables, I guess, other than makeup water. So let's look a little bit more at those uh, eddy covariance instruments so that you can uh, at least have seen them. So I uh, grabbed this uh, guide from one of the manufacturers. And if we look at the overview of the principles, Um, what it has that's um, attractive for research and practical uh, research and um, routine monitoring application is the ability to make direct flux measurements. And like everything, it has assumptions and um, it is an equation based thing after the instrument makes the measurements. Uh, so the Gas analyzer can determine the amount of water, carbon dioxide, methane, and some other gases in that moving air that's going through the ET's finger. And these towers are, um, are put up and the sonic anerometer can can measure these eddies as it moves by. So it has a way of correcting for horizontal advective flux as well as the uh, vertical um, components. And it describes how to measure flux. And then the equations look no more complicated, in my opinion, than the energy balance one, uh, except for these um, averaging terms. And this is all handled internally in instrument software. Uh, while it's useful to understand how it's um, working, um, most of the uh, uh, terms are headed internally in the um, uh, software. And then from the general equation, we can get uh, a couple of um, what they call practical formulas. And um, then the listing of uh, assumptions. Then it goes on to the data processing. Um, again, all in bullet items. And this is, this is going to be a good read if you ever have to implement one of these instruments. Um, the key thing to remember is um, because of the costs involved, you don't just put these out and leave them out for two weeks. Uh, you have to run them for quite a while um, to obtain um, an initial good set of measurements. The 
Other um, thing I want to take you to is evapotranspiration measurement methods. So this is a, a fact sheet written by a person named J.W. Shuttleworth, who interestingly enough is quite well known in the evapotranspiration literature. So I would consider this, at the time of writing, a thorough um, overview of the existing methods. Um, so the evaporation pan is a water budget measurement technique, and it's usually combined with a lysimeter or a soil moisture uh, measurement because the value of the pan is a pan just measures raw evaporation in a metal tank, at least one kind of pan does. And we're usually interested in the evapotranspiration from a, uh, a, a plot of vegetative cover. The lysimeter gives us the ability to keep track of the uh, water in and out of that plot that gets correlated to the pan that correlation coefficient or um, uh, is called the pan coefficient and it's unique to it's at least unique to a crop type if not possibly to um, a general location uh, the you know the Lubbock to a county size location I guess I'll say um, but once those pan coefficients are determined, uh, there are some other methods to um, keep uh, track based on latitude. So it's actually a fairly flexible technique. So, and pans are cheap. Uh, moving up in complexity, the energy budget, which we've already seen, and the eddy correlation machine, which I just showed a picture of, uh, become the next more uh, complex uh, system. Although the eddy correlation is very attractive because it's thought that it actually um, is calculating evaporation and because you can locate it a few meters above vegetation um, it can be uh, considered a direct measurement of evapotranspiration. And then we get to some more um, elaborate uh, methods. Uh, transpiration method by monitoring sap flow, that's clearly not going to be easy to do from an engineering science perspective. And then we get to the exotic um, remote sensing estimates. And these are, these are at best uh, approximations, in my opinion, probably not much better than the uh, thorn wave or Turk model or some other model to look at shortly. Uh, scintillometer is going to be um, unusually applied because scintillation meter is dealing with um, detecting electromagnetic and possibly radioactive materials. Anyway, this is a really useful fact sheet. So that's why I included it here. It's actually got words written here. Um, and this, this part I really like. Uh, it's got a description of the strengths and weaknesses of a particular method. So returning to our uh, presentation, there he is. Um, I would say we've beaten these to death. So let's look more at the pan evaporation, namely because I have a lot of understanding of that. And these are um, this these pictures are from the World Meteorological um, Organization. So the attractiveness of pan is that it can be used anywhere in the world. Um, even by people that don't have engineering degrees. In fact, it can be used by uh, people who are not um, handicapped with such a degree. <laughs> that, was, uh, that, that didn't come out right. Uh, but they're used in conjunction with the similar instruments to, and they get calibrated to a crop. So we make a, initially we make an evaporation pan measurement and we use an elicimeter measurement and our reference crop is grass, and over time we'll be able to associate 
the pan evaporation rate with the um, evapotranspiration rate from, from uh, a particular reference crop. Let's say for the sake of argument that that pan coefficient is 0.38. Then we can make evaporation pan measurements anywhere, at least within the uh, vicinity of these crops where the climate conditions are about the same, and multiply those values by 0.38 and estimate what the behavior of that crop would be in a different location. So there's a couple of types of pans. Um, if you read about them, you might be given the impression that their dimensional requirements are, are precise. I don't think that's so. I think a couple of dimensional requirements that are illustrated in different uh, contexts are a form of standardization so that the pan coefficients can be easily transferred from pan to pan. So anything measured with a class A circular, the pan coefficient should be valid for any other class A circular. In the case of this uh, Colorado sunken, um, which is basically one yard square and 25, oh, maybe a foot and a half deep, two feet. Uh, I'm having trouble mentally doing it. But and the key is um, a little bit above the uh, land surface. So this thing's measuring a little bit above the land surface. And then these are normally on a pallet. Um, you can see by the um, hydrographer's height, the pans aren't too tall. And that's common for a pan evaporation. You don't want the side walls to be too tall for two reasons. One would be you're getting solar rate radiation hitting the side. And if you have too much surface area, You'll be getting pan heating that may not be reflective of the direct heating onto the water surface. That's clearly not a problem in the Colorado pan. Um, uh, the second reason is that it affects the wind patterns. Uh, so we want them to be shallow so that they represent close to the ground behavior. Uh, the, the other um, issue in the Colorado pan is there's a little bit of um, about a two inch uh, wall height here um, so that a water rainwater can come in and has a way to get out and the makeup water uh, has a way to get out and then this one is very much at the surface it's very much trying to measure at the surface behavior I don't think the dimensions in the planar area are particularly important except again to compare pan coefficient to pan coefficient in the case of the circular pan, I uh, maintain that a small microprocessor with appropriate sensors and a pump controller could replace this dude. Um, the only thing the processor would hard to do would be to put the cravat on it. Because I don't know where you would attach the tie to the microprocessor. Um, maybe at its power supply. Um, you just program it to add water every 24 hours until full. And the full, not full, in the in the whole scheme of detection, that's really easy to do. Um, you can measure the amount of makeup water uh, through a hull, uh, a hull um, flow detector. Hull is a uh, physics property. I'm not saying the whole name correctly. It doesn't come to mind right now. But a, uh, a hull phenomenon detector. Uh, basically, it's a counting instrument. And um, they can be made very accurate, they, they're extremely low power. So, uh, you know, a battery, a battery would run for an eternity uh, using one of these devices. Uh, air temperature, water temperature, easy to get instruments to do that. Um, thermistors is one thing, except that those are going to require a constant voltage, and so that's going to burn into your power supply. Um, there's other ways to measure temperature. Barometric pressure, uh, same thing that's actually fairly easy to get even if you spell it wrong. And then solar radiation can be well approximated with uh, certain types of light meters. So a, a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino hooked up to uh, this widget, um, add in uh, a rain gauge and a wind uh, measurement 
and for a few hundred dollars you can completely automate this pan and remotely interrogate it. That would be the coolest part. You don't have to go visit it. You would from time to time to be sure it uh, isn't broken or hasn't been vandalized or found its way into a true crime movie. So the operation of pan is pretty straightforward. It's put out in the field, it's filled with a known quantity. You start off with a known quantity of water, although um, that's um, overcomplicating it. It's filled up to water to a prescribed depth, and that's the depth that all measurements are made relative to. The water is allowed to evaporate for a certain period of time. Usually it's 24 hours. Any more than that, it's conceivable that the pan could dry out before you get to make your next visit, and you wouldn't know what the evaporation was at that point. If there's any incoming rainfall, that's measured simultaneously, and then every 24 hours, the water level is adjusted back to that original reference depth. So if there was evaporation, water is added to it back to the uh, depth. If there was excess rainfall, water is removed until it's uh, back at the reference depth. Those volumes are recorded, or I guess those, those are watershed inches. Those depth changes are recorded, and um, the net difference between the two is called the uh, pan evaporation depth. It's usually reported in millimeters or inches in the United States. And um, here the um, hydrographer is taking excess water until the um, water level, in this case, is five centimeters below the rim, about two inches. And here there's makeup water being added because it evaporated off. Once those evaporation values are known, if we have the pan coefficient, we can use that product of evaporation times pan coefficient to get the um, evapotranspiration <coughs> uh, potential. And then we reset the pan for the next time. The pan constants, they have to be determined by lysimeter or eddy covariance instruments. Um, of the two, lysimeters are certainly easier to construct and operate, but they use a lot of real estate, and they also take a long time to produce um, meaningful results. Um, the eddy covariance instrument, we've already discussed the cost of operating it. Uh, they have some advantages that they could be put out for a couple months, and that's probably all they would need to do to produce meaningful results for estimating a pan constant, and then move to another uh, plot. So there's um, some economy of that. Whereas lysimeters are not that easy to pick up. Well, they, they can't be picked up and moved. Um, then once we've made those measurements, um, here's an example. We have a class A pan. Uh, on day one, the water depth was 150 millimeters. Day two, 144 millimeters. So we've lost six millimeters of water in the pan. We've have zero millimeters of rainfall, so we have a net loss of six millimeters. We have a pan coefficient of 0.75. We perform the arithmetic and the evapotranspiration ET sub zero. The potential is 0.75 times six, which is four and a half millimeters per day in this example. So the, the pan tools are pretty um, attractive. Uh, in the absence of either of those kind of things, uh, what's been used for quite a while are um, evapotranspiration models. And I'm going to look at th uh, three pretty common ones here. And then I have some material that was prepared for some other ones. Uh, it's incomplete, so we'll skip through that real fast. All three of these, so Blaney, Criddle, Thornwaith, and Turk, I spelled Turk incorrectly. The correct spelling is T-U-R-C. Um, they're all similar in that they're correlations to average measurements made at many different locations, and then the information is tabulated. They're all just approximations, but they're useful in practice, and when evaporation, evaporation matters, they might actually be the only tool available. So... Bear that in mind. Um, I would argue that they're all at about the same level of complexity. So 
You can use whatever you have access to or whatever you're more comfortable to. Um, I, myself, in my career, would probably lean to the Thornwaite method because it's the one I heard about and played with the most. But uh, the other two, I would imagine, are just as useful. So we'll start with Blaney Criddle. Uh, it's really simple. It only needs temperature and latitude. And it estimates the daily rate for a particular month um, based on this formula here on period temperatures in Celsius. Uh, 0.46 times the mean temperature plus 8 multiplied by this factor P. And we look up the value of P in a table. And the table has um, two entries. It has a month, what month of the year uh, you're considering, and your latitude north or latitude south. The, the temperature is obtained um, from average daily values. And um, the easiest way is to sum up all the maximum temperatures of the day for a month and divide by the number of days. Sum up the minimum, divide by the number of days, and then take the arithmetic mean of this T max and T min. And here's an example of what the uh, table looks like. <coughs> Notice the table is um, latitude moving from the equator north or south, and the only difference between north or south is which month of the year it applies to. So January in a northern latitude is equivalent to July in a southern latitude. Um, basically, the winters and summers are you know, one plus six, six months apart. Um, these are pretty easy to put into uh, any kind of tool. So there's a spreadsheet-based tool uh, that makes Blaney Criddle estimates. And if you do a Google search, you'll come up with uh, similar calculators. This is not too difficult to uh, convert to an R script for a long-term simulator. Uh, the key is just you put the p-factor table in as a, um, a dictionary-type list, which is a, a list that the contents don't change, so you can't accidentally break it with your scripting environment. And then you uh, give the mean values of temperature, it looks up a p-value, and it calculates the evapotranspiration. Uh, the Thornwave method is also simple like Blaney Criddle, but it's got a few more terms. Um, because his name is longer than it's one person, he had to make it more complicated. Uh, the potential evaporation uh, is given by this formula here, 16 uh, times the quantity 10 theta divided by uh, capital I raised to the power A multiplied by uh, an F of lambda function. So here's the F of lambda table. And A is computed by this um, equation is cubic uh, based on I, the annual thermal index, which is the sum of the monthly thermal indexes. And the monthly thermal index is the mean temperature divided by 5 raised to the 1.514 power. So th this seems a bit elaborate, but it could all be collapsed probably into a, a single factor by month. And at the time this was written, which was quite a while ago, it's in this, this particular type set is from the 1980s. The method's much older than that. Um, the author was writing these expressions in a way that was easy to calculate in the days of hand calculators. And it too is pretty simple to put into a, a spreadsheet. And uh, here we have the same uh, latitude um, inputs and the various thermal indices based on mean monthly air temperature. And the uh, table lookup does all the computation and calculates the monthly potential evapotranspiration rate, in this case in millimeters. This too is not too difficult to program. Um, and then Turk's model is more elaborate still in that it considers relative humidity. So Turk's model uses um, 
air temperature measured in shelter, a solar radiation value, um, kappa H is the maximum amount of sun, sunshine, which is the uh, length of the day in an in astronomical context, lowercase h is the actual amount of sunshine, and then I is the direct solar radiation at the top of the atmosphere. The I and the cap H are tabulated based on latitude. So technically, this just uses latitude as an input, temperature, and some computations to uh, handle the radiation component. And then finally, uh, the average relative humidity. So if we're in a temperate zone where the relative humidity is bigger than 50%, 50%. So the air is somewhat wet all the time. Uh, we use the upper formula, and if we're in an arid climate, like here in Lubbock, we would use the lower formula. Um, here's the uh, additional tables that are required for Turk's method. And I don't have a spreadsheet to do the calculations, but that would be a relatively um, um, simple thing to do, to put it into an R script or a spreadsheet. So I stipulate that. Turk, Blady, Criddle, and Thornway are straightforward enough to be generally applicable um, in any situation, except maybe at the North Pole or the South Pole, in which case you're worried about not freezing to death. Evapotranspiration is of uh, less importance to you. And the next part was going to review some more elaborate um, models of uh, evaporation, evapotranspiration. I'm just going to go through the names. So there was a Penman-Monteith model that started with Penman's original model and then some dude named Monteith and him arm wrestled and decided to hyphenate it. And let's see if we can get to the end. Um, the Penman-Monteith model has a fairly elaborate series of computations which again could be put into a, a computer program to get evaporation rates. And so the Penman Monteith, if we look here, we have internal stomatal resistance. This is the first one of the models that we've listed today that actually considers something about the, uh, the plants. So it is an evapotranspiration estimator. Um, it has formulas for the uh, different resistances. And the uh, internal stoma resistance is proportional to the leaf area index. And this is where I stopped trying to translate this. Because I, I don't have access, I don't know where to look for leaf area indices for different uh, crop types. I'm absolutely sure the information exists. And if that were the case, it would be a useful activity once we had those indices or tables to go ahead and program this up into a general tool for use. So hence it's uh, listed as under construction. The next um, one is called the Shuttleworth-Wallace model. Shuttleworth was the, uh, was the name in the fact sheet that I showed you earlier where he listed the different types of measurement techniques, their pros and cons. Um, and so this is a combination of um, an energy input and resistances based on plants and soil. So this is also truly a, um, a evapotranspiration model. Um, the f initial formula looks pretty simple, but every letter of the alphabet there has nearly an entire um, novel behind it to get a numerical value in order to estimate the heat flux. And so I have skipped those for another time. So that is the modeling approach. Um, another approach to this would be to take a data science approach. And there are locations where data are available, and we could use that to estimate evaporation based on temperature, rainfall, and solar radiation. So let's look at an example for Texas. Uh, I have this well, I'll go look at this example, and then I'll dabble a little bit about um, some initial work that I can show that's so you can work sweet. Okay, 
So now you can recognize the plot behind my head. So the blue dots, um, so I've gone to waterfordatatexas.org, lake evaporation rainfall. Uh, this is a subdomain of uh, Texas Water Development Board website. The blue dots represent um, NOAA National Weather Service uh, evaporation pans, and the orange dots are Texas Water Development Board evaporation pans. So those are the uh, physical locations. That seems awful sparse when you consider how cheap a pan is to install and operate. So it has some legitimate concern there. And, and what the uh, Water Development Board has done for quite a while, since the 50s, um, is they operate some of these pans and then there's a fairly elaborate model that's used to produce an estimate of evaporation in a particular month in one of these uh, grid cells. And um, on this website, if you search hard enough, you won't find anything that geo-references the location of these cells. I happen to know that it uses the, uh, it's using the same Oh, that is weird. I just disappeared. Let's see if I can get this into the... Oh, it's got to be by my face. Um, it uses the same grids as on this map. And so grid number 104, the centroid of that grid is... Um, Thirty-six point five degrees north, one hundred and three point five degrees west. Or the other way to uh, look at that is the uh, one hundred four cell. Its left edge is at um, west one hundred four, um, but and its bottom edge is at thirty-six degrees north. So I would say that's a disadvantage of the data science method if you can't get the, the geo-references. Okay, so now we've established what that grid refers to. And um, at one time in the history of the uh, website, uh, that information was disclosed. So I would argue it was a mistake on behalf of the Water Development Board that they they certainly have the geolocation of those grid cells. They just inadvertently uh, failed to provide a convenient way to uh, get that information. Or maybe it's here on the website and I'm just stupid, um, which is quite possible. I'm not stupid, but I, I can miss stuff. So we can um, select a particular quad ID. You can either, I think you can do it directly on the map. I'm going to choose 911. Nothing will happen. I'll try again. There we go. It switched to 911. And I'm making a nice little pretty picture for us of the gross evaporation. Um, I think it has the monthly signal. You can see it looks sort of like it's all over the place, but it has, um, you can argue it has some sort of mean pattern. Um, it has this circular diagram that I have no idea how to interpret, but it's a cool plot, which is undoubtedly what was on in the minds of the programmers. Um, claims it has Panda Lake coefficients, and we could download those. Uh, I'm not going to do that. I'll save that for another time. We can get net evaporation, which is going to be gross minus precipitation. We can also get a precipitation signal download there, and um, I won't do it because I already have it at a server. Okay, so that's a source of evaporation data. That's only half of our data science uh, question because if all we did was work on this data, the best we could do is an auto, an auto regression type of estimate to the future or a nearest neighbor thing, which would be if this is um, January of 2016, then the Gross evaporation would be 
some weighted thing of all the prior Januaries plus whatever the uh, previous December was. Um, that's usable, but it's uh, certainly, um, I'd almost say amateurish in today's uh, thing. But if we had uh, radiation data, then we might actually have a, predict a predictive tool. Because we could look at the last few months of uh, solar radiation, last few months of rainfall, last few months of measured evaporation, and predict um, the near future, which would be the whole point of doing that. So, I am going to return to my PowerPoint. And so we would look at this. I mean, this would be good coverage in the context that there's nothing else available. So we can get precip evap and net evaporation for all the cells. We'd want to find temperature and solar radiation elsewhere and come up with some sort of correlation model. So here's what I'm suggesting. This is just to complete the um, discussion. Perhaps the evaporation in the cell is some function. Here's the phi function of the prior three months uh, temperature, the prior three months precipitation, the month that we're predicting, and the prior three months of solar radiation, as, as a for instance. And so the other thing to do would be to figure out where we could get the uh, solar radiation information from. That was conveniently disclosed in one of our prior lessons. Hopefully that gets me to the right one. Perfect. If we go back to... I think it was in hydrologic cycle. If we want solar radiation, we can go to um, the National Radiation Energy Lab. We get it in maps. Um, I don't need it in geospatial. Uh, I, I don't visit this that much. Takes me a few seconds to figure out. I don't necessarily need the rasters. I want to get the drafts. Go to the main page. Go in the front door. Sometimes that's the best way. Hopefully I didn't take that. Okay, good. We're getting there. And I want full collection. I think this is what I'm going to want. The National Solar Radiation Database. Hopefully I didn't take that. Yeah, oh, beautiful. Okay, now this takes a little bit of fussing around and I'm trying to get, um, there's a, one of these links goes to um, the actual uh, data. This was not it. And of course, it's now in go slow mode. So we hit the pop off and now. Archives. Oh, please do the right thing. So th this is typical for hunting day. Okay, this is what I was looking for. Here's a national database from 1961 to 1990. I have a point for doing that. And then 91 to 2010, the database structure changed, although it has mostly the same uh, stations. Let's look at the... Uh, wait, I don't want to do that. I want to actually look at it. No. This literally has changed in the last week. Archive. Now we'll go ahead and gamble.
We're not going to do that. There is a variant here where you can um, get the PDF file and then you can actually get the uh, archive data by location. Maybe it is in the viewer. It's not working the way uh, I want it to. So we will ignore it. Um, once we have the radiation data, so the, the demonstration I was going to attempt was we we're going to get the solar radiation data by month, by year for Corpus Christi, which is pretty close to cell 911 in the um, evaporation database and then try to correlate the two. Uh, that's not going to happen today because I can't get at the data. Because I, I forgot where it was. And uh, doing it live it would have been of no value to watch me poke around uh, the internet for you. Um, that concludes uh, what I want to talk about evaporation. I have one last thing. So when we get into the computer programs, um, here is uh, the user manual for HEC HMS, and you'll see that uh, it has an evapotranspiration method, but there's really not that much here in this part of the manual. We have to go to the technical manual, which is a different document, to see what method is implemented. There's similar um, capability in SWIM, and so when we get to those points, we will examine those two, the, the, how the methods are represented in the, um, in, the, in the models. I would imagine that they are some variant of uh, Thornwaith or Turk or possibly a Penman Monte. So that now concludes um, today's lesson and I have, I think, three questions programmed. So after you've had a chance to look it over, run through the questions and you complete the lesson. Uh, so now there's a few minutes left. I want to query everybody on what is your status on exercise set one. Are you, in your own opinion, making good progress and foresee being able to submit it tomorrow? Good so far. Okay. Um, in the last part of yesterday's video, which is being uploaded as we speak, uh, I attempt to do the Placid Watershed, I think, three times. I think the third time I get it right. And um, so if you're having troubles with that, by all means, watch that. And bear in mind that the last time is the one I got it is when I get it right. And, you know, they get it right, get it wrong. That's kind of a experiential thing. You, you sort of, over time, know if you've gotten goofy results. And I kept getting negative areas, and it took me a while to realize it was because I was defining my reference area going clockwise and then doing my measurement area counterclockwise. The numbers are correct, um, but... By changing the direction of the integration, I basically change the sign of the contour integral. Um, and since I don't do uh, advanced calculus very much anymore, uh, it took me a while to figure out that's what I've done. So um, that was not intended to be as challenging as it, as it appears to be. But that will be the only, only time you'll have to hand delineate um, I may have an exam question where you hand delineate a different watershed. It'll it'll be more obvious, but that'll be it. In the future, for practical application, you will pray that you have access to software that can do a lot of the work for you. But now you know how. Anyone else? Um, I have a question. 
about the website survey. I try to um so I put in the address of the of the of the watershed area and then when I was trying to download the data for the soil properties, I couldn't open the file. I haven't used it in quite a while myself. And press the green button. Now I have to find Placid, Texas. See, I, I can't remember where Placid is. It's somewhere in Central Texas, isn't it? Yes. So I put in Placid, Texas in the address and I I look up for the county where the pocket is. It's, a, it's in McCoola County. There we go. Now we have to find our watershed, which we would get from the latitude and longitude because I'm pretty sure we can enter latitude and longitude. Do you have that in front of you handy or not? Uh, I'll, I'll get it. I'll get it. Don't don't. <laughs> I have it. No, that's the wrong one. Dang it. Yes, I have it. Um... Oh, I know where it is. It should be in the, uh, no, that's kind of embarrassing. I can't actually, uh, find the, uh, homework. So survey. I have it for a different watershed. That's kind of um, not my intent. So I have to get it from the website. I can do that. It's pretty quick if I can. Hopefully, it maintained my cookie. Did it set the session cookie. No, oh, please. Yay! Cool. Thirty-one eighteen. Latitude one. Thirty-one degrees eighteen minutes. Twenty minutes is a third of a degree. Thirty-one point three three north and a hundred something. 99 degrees, 7 minutes, so this would be 99 degrees west. Hopefully it can, um... Oh, cool, it did parse it. Excellent. So we're somewhere in this area. Is that what you came up with? Yes. Yeah, I'm just going to uh, zoom in on the area. Wow, it looks different um, in aerial imagery than it does in the map. And then you want to um, find out the uh, soil types. So you got to select an area of interest. I think you do that. I hope I made it. There we go. 
Do your area of interest. So you can draw a polygon. I may have done it too small. Oh, I didn't. Okay, so there's my area of interest. And then you uh, work through the remainder and you can get the, uh, the uh, soil types associated with the area of interest properties. And, and that's the basic way to use the uh, uh, soil map. Use symbols, sure, we use national maps. So I've just drawn a 28 acre uh, plot, which is way too small. But I, I think the, um, the uh, watershed comes out to be a, a couple of uh, square kilometers, um, which would be um, almost a square mile. So this is like nearly 100 acre, 100 times too small. 20 times, 10 times too small, 30 times too small. Uh, and then as you uh, work through this, you can get um, different information. The uh, Try and remember uh, to generate the soil map, pick the soil map tab, and now it's giving us um, the uh, soil types and I think Data Explorer will tell us what the permeabilities are. At least it used to. One of these will tell us the uh, soil permeability, which is meaningful in hydrology, not health. And, oh, soil properties and qualities. If I just read, so physical properties, and has saturated hydraulic conductivities for the two zones. You've zoomed in. Um, okay, so we have too small of an area, but um, that's the kind of information you're uh, trying to recover. And then um, we could generate a report. Although I'm at too small an area. So it says it's uh, not valid. And that was what's intended by that part of the exercise. So you'll have to figure out how to draw your <clears throat> watershed on the uh, soil map. OK. Does that help? Yes. OK. Thank you. I'm going to get out of here before I make a fool out of myself. There we go. Bye. Um, <clears throat>